To Be or Not to Be by Kurt Vonnegut, Jr. Everything was perfectly swell. There were no prisons, no slums, no insane asylums, no cripples, no poverty, no wars. All diseases were conquered, so was old age. Death, barring accidents, was an adventure for volunteers. The population of the United States was stabilized at 40 million souls. One bright morning in the Chicago Lying in Hospital, a man named Edward K. Welling Jr. waited for his wife to give birth. He was the only man waiting. Not many people were born a day anymore. Welling was 56, a mere stripling in a population whose average age was 129. X-rays had revealed that his wife was going to have triplets. The children would be his first. Young Welling was hunched in his chair, his head in his hand. He was so rumpled, so still and colorless, as to be virtually invisible. His camouflage was perfect, since the waiting room had a disorderly and demoralized air, too. Chairs and ashtrays had been moved away from the walls. The floor was paved with spattered drop cloths. The room was being redecorated. It was being redecorated as a memorial to a man who had volunteered to die. A sardonic old man, about 200 years old, sat on a stepladder, painting a mural he did not like. Back in the days when people aged visibly, his age would have been guessed at 35 or so. Aging had touched him that much before the cure for aging was found. The mural he was working on depicted a very neat garden. Men and women in white, doctors and nurses, turned the soil, planted seedlings, sprayed bugs, spread fertilizer. Men and women in purple uniforms pulled up weeds, cut down plants that were old and sickly, raked leaves, carried refuse to trash burners. Never, 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 not even in medieval Holland nor old Japan, had a garden been more formal, been better tended. Every plant had all the loam, light, water, air, and nourishment it could use. A hospital orderly came down the corridor, singing under his breath a popular song. If you don't like my kisses, honey, here's what I will do. I'll go see a girl in purple, kiss the sad world to Lou. If you don't want my loving, why should I take up all this space? I'll get off this old planet, let some sweet baby have my place. The orderly looked in at the mural and the muralist. It looks so real, he said. I can practically imagine I'm standing in the middle of it. What makes you think you are not in it? said the painter. He gave a satiric smile. It's called the happy garden of life, you know. That's good of Dr. Heath, said the orderly. He was referring to one of the male figures in white, whose head was a portrait of Dr. Benjamin Heath, the hospital's chief obstetrician. He was a blindingly handsome man. Lots of faces still to fill in, said the orderly. He meant that the faces of many of the figures in the mural were still blank. All blanks were to be filled with portraits of important people on either the hospital staff or from the Chicago office of the Federal Bureau of Termination. Must be nice to be able to make pictures that look like something, said the orderly. The painter's face curdled with scorn. You think I'm proud of this job, he said. You think this is my idea of what life really looks like? What's your idea of what life looks like, said the orderly. The painter gestured at a foul drop cloth. There is a good picture of it, he said. Frame that and you'll have a picture at them sight more honest than this one. You're a gloomy old duck, aren't you, said the orderly. Is that a crime, said the painter. The orderly shrugged. If you don't like it here, Grandpa, he said and he finished the thought with a trick telephone number that people who didn't want to live anymore were supposed to call. The zero in the telephone number he pronounced not. The number was 2 B R not 2 b 
It was the telephone number of an institution whose fanciful sobriquets included Automat, Birdland, Canary, Catbox, The Louser, Easy Go, Goodbye Mother, Happy Hooligan, Kiss Me Quick, Lucky Peer, Sheep Deep, Boring Blender, Weep No More, and Why Worry. To Be or Not to Be was the telephone number of the municipal gas chambers of the Federal Bureau of Termination. The painter thumbed his nose at the orderly. When I decide it's time to go, he said, it won't be at the ship deep. A do it yourself, aha, uh-huh, said the orderly. Messy business, Grandpa. Why don't you have a little consideration for the people who have to clean up after you? The painter expressed with an obscenity his lack of concern for the tribulations of his survivors. The world could do with a good deal more mess, if you ask me, he said. The orderly left and moved on. Welling, the waiting father, mumbled something without raising his head, and then he fell silent again. A coarse, formidable woman strode into a waiting room on a spike hills. Her shoes, stockings, trench coat, bag, and overseas cap were all purple. The purple the painter called the color of grapes on Judgment Day. The medallion on her purple musette bag was the seal of the service division of the Federal Bureau of Termination, an eagle perched on a turnstile. The woman had a lot of facial hair, an unmistakable mustache, in fact. A curious thing about guest chamber hostesses was that no matter how lovely and feminine they were when recruited, they all sprouted mustaches within five years or so. Is this where I'm supposed to come? She said to the painter. A lot would depend on what your business was, he said. You aren't about to have a baby, are you? They told me I was supposed to pose for some pictures, she said. My name is Leora Duncan. She waited. And you dunk people, he said. What? She said. Skip it, he said. That sure is a beautiful picture, she said. Looks just like heaven or something. Or something, said the painter. He took a list of names from his smock pocket. Duncan, 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 he said, scanning the list. Yes, here you are. You are entitled to be immortalized. See any faceless body here you'd like me to stick your head on? We've got a few choice ones left. She studied the mural bleakly. Gee, she said. They're all the same to me. I don't know anything about art. A body is a body, huh? He said. All righty. As a master of fine art, I recommend this body here. He indicated a faceless figure of a woman who was carrying dried stalks to a trash burner. Well, said Leonard Duncan, that's more disposable people, isn't it? I mean, I'm in service. I don't do any disposing. The painter clapped his hands in mock delight. You say you don't know anything about art. And then you prove in the next breath that you know more about it than I do. Of course, the sheaf carrier is wrong for a hostess. A snipper, a pruner, that's more your line. He pointed to a figure in purple who was sawing a dead branch from an apple tree. How about her? He said. You like her at all? Gosh, she said as she blushed and became humble. That, that puts me right next to Dr. Hitz. That upsets you, he said. Good gravy, no, she said. It's it's just such an honor. Huh. You you admire him, huh? He said. Who does not admire him, she said, worshipping the portrait of Hitz. It was the portrait of a tanned, white haired, omnipotent Zeus, two hundred and forty years old. Who does not admire him, she said again. He was responsible for setting up the very first gas chamber in Chicago. Nothing would please me more, said the painter, than to put you next to him for all time. Sewing off a limb, that strikes you as appropriate? That is kind of like what I do, she said. She was demure about what she did. What she did was make people comfortable. Well, she killed them. And while Leora Duncan was posing for her portrait, into the waiting room bounded Dr. Hitz himself. He was seven feet tall, and he boomed with importance, accomplishments, and the joy of living. 
Well, Miss Duncan, Miss Duncan, he said, and he made a joke. What are you doing here, he said. This is not where the people live. This is where they come in. We are going to be in the same picture together, she said shyly. Good, said Dr. Hitz heartily. And say, isn't that some picture? I sure I'm honored to be in it with you, she said. Let me tell you, he said. I'm honored to be in it with you. Without women like you, this wonderful world we've got wouldn't be possible. He saluted her and moved toward the door that led to the delivery rooms. Guess what was just born, he said. I can't, she said. Triplets, he said. Triplets, she said. She was exclaiming over the legal implications of triplets. The law said that no newborn child could survive unless the parents of the child could find someone who would volunteer to die. Triplets, if they were all to leave, called for three volunteers. Do the parents have three volunteers? said Leora Duncan. Last I heard, said Dr. Hitz, they had one, and were trying to scrape another two up. I don't think they made it, she said. Nobody made three appointments with us. Nothing but singles going through today. Unless somebody called in after I left. What's the name? Welling, said the waiting father, sitting up, red-eyed and frowsy. Edward K. Welling Jr. is the name of the happy father-to-be. He raised his right hand, looked at a spot on the wall, gave a hoarsely wretched chuckle. Present, he said. Oh, Mr. Welling, said Dr. Hitz, I didn't see you. The invisible man, said Welling. They just phoned me that your triplets have been born, said Dr. Hitz. They're all fine, so is the mother. I'm on my way in to see them now. Hooray, said Welling emptily. You don't sound very happy, said Dr. Hitz. What man in my shoes wouldn't be happy, said Welling. He gestured with his hands to symbolize carefree simplicity. All I have to do is pick out which one of the triplets is going to leave, then deliver my maternal grandfather to the happy hooligan and come back here with the receipt. Dr. Hitz became rather severe with Welling, towered over him. You don't believe in population control, Mr. Welling, he said. I think it's perfectly keen, said Welling tautly. Would you like to go back to the good old days when the population of the Earth was 20 billion, about to become 40 billion, then 80 billion, then 160 billion? Do you know what a druplet is, Mr. Welling, said Hitz. Nope, said Welling sulkily. A druplet, Mr. Welling, is one of the little knobs one of the little pulpy grains of a blackberry, said Dr. Hitz. Without population control, human beings would now be packed on this surface of this old planet, like droplets on a blackberry. Think of it. Welling continued to stare at the same spot on the wall. In the year 2000, said Dr. Hitz, before scientists stepped in and laid down the law, there was not enough drinking water to go around, and nothing to eat but seaweed, and still people insisted on their right to reproduce like jackrabbits, and their right, if possible, to live forever. I want those kids, said Welling quietly. I want all three of them. Of course you do, said Dr. Hitz. That's only human. I don't want my grandfather to die either said Welling. Nobody's really happy about taking a close relative to the cat box, said Dr. Hitz gently, sympathetically. I wish people would not call it that, said Leora Duncan. What, said Dr. Hitz. I wish people would not call it the cat box, and things like that, she said. It gives people the wrong impression. You're absolutely right, said Dr. Hitz. Forgive me. He corrected himself, gave the municipal gas chambers their official title, a title no one ever used in conversation. I should have said, Ethical Suicide Studios, he said. That sounds so much better, said Leora Duncan. 
This child of yours, whichever one you decide to keep, Mr. Welling, said Dr. Hitz, he or she is going to live on a happy, roomy, clean, rich planet, thanks to population control, in a garden like the mural there. He shook his head. Two centuries ago, when I was a young man, it was a hell that nobody thought could last another 20 years. Now centuries of peace and plenty stretch before us as far as the imagination cares to travel. He smiled luminously. The smile faded as he saw that Welling had just drawn a revolver. Welling shot Dr. Hitz dead. There is room for one, a great big one, he said. And then he shot Leora Duncan. It's only death, he said to her as she fell. There, room for two. And then he shot himself, making room for all three of his children. Nobody came running. Nobody, seemingly, heard the shots. The painter sat on the top of his stepladder, looking down reflectively on the sorry scene. The painter pondered the mournful puzzle of life, demanding to be born, and once born, demanding to be fruitful, to multiply, and to live as long as possible, to do all that on a very small planet that would have to last forever. All the answers that the painter could think of were grim, even grimmer, surely, than a cat box, a happy hooligan, an easy go. He thought of war. He thought of plague. He thought of starvation. He knew that he would never paint again. He let his paintbrush fall to the drop cloths below. And then he decided he had had about enough of life in the happy garden of life, too and he came slowly down from the ladder. He took Welling's pistol, really intending to shoot himself, but he did not have the nerve. And then he saw the telephone booth in the corner of the room. He went to it, dialed the well-remembered number 2B or not 2B. Federal Bureau of Termination, said the very warm voice of hostess. How soon could I get an appointment? he asked, speaking very carefully. We could probably fit you in late this afternoon, sir, she said. It might even be earlier if we get a cancellation. All right, said the painter. Fit me in, if you please. And he gave her his name, spelling it out. Thank you, sir, said the hostess. Your city thanks you. Your country thanks you. Your planet thanks you. But the deepest thanks of all is from future generations. The End A Little Journey Ray Bradbury She'd paid good money to see the inevitable and then had to work to make it happen. There were two important things. One, that she was very old. Two, that Mr. Thurkill was taking her to God. For had not he patted her hand and said, Mrs. Bellows will take off into space in my rocket and go to find him together. And that was how it was going to be. Oh, this was not like any other group Mrs. Bellows had ever joined. In her fervor to light a path to her delicate, tottering feet, she had struck matches down dark alleys and found her way to Hindu mystics who floated their flickering, starry eyelashes over crystal balls. She had walked on the meadow paths with ascetic Indian philosophers, imported by daughters in spirit of Madame Blavatsky. She had made pilgrimages to California's stucco jungles, to hunt the astrological seer in his natural habitat. She had even consented to signing away the rights to one of her homes in order to be taken into the shouting order of a temple of amazing evangelists who had promised her golden smoke, crystal fire, and the great soft hand of God coming to bear her home. None of these people had ever shaken Mrs. Bellows' faith. 
even when she saw them sirened away in a black wagon in the night, or discovered their pictures bleak and unromantic in the morning tabloids. The world had dropped them up and locked them away because they knew too much, that was all. And then, two weeks ago, she had seen Mr. Thurkel's advertisement in New York City. Come to Mars! Stay at the Thurkel Restorium for one week, and then on into space on the greatest adventure life can offer. Send for free pamphlet. Nearer, my God, to thee. Excursion rates. Round trip slightly lower. Round trip, Mrs. Bellows had thought, but who would come back after seeing him? And so she had bought a ticket and flown off to Mars and spent seven mild days at Mr. Thurkel's Restorium, the building with a sign on it which flashed Thurkel's rocket to heaven. She had spent the week bathing in limpid waters and erasing the care from her tiny bones, and now she was fidgeting, ready to be loaded into Mr. Thurkel's own special private rocket, like a bullet, to be fired on out into space beyond Jupiter and Saturn and Pluto. And thus, who could deny it, you would be getting nearer and nearer to the Lord. How wonderful! Couldn't you just feel him drawing near? Couldn't you just sense his breath, his scrutiny, his presence? Here I am, said Mrs. Bellows, an ancient rickety elevator ready to go up the shaft. God need only press the button. Now, on the seventh day, as she minced up the steps of the restorium, a number of small doubts assailed her. For one thing, she said aloud to no one, it isn't quite the land of milk and honey here on Mars that they said it would be. My room is like a cell. The swimming pool is really quite inadequate. And besides... How many widows, who look like mushrooms or skeletons, want to swim? And finally, the whole restorium smells of boiled cabbage and tennis shoes. She opened the front door and let it slam somewhat irritably. She was amazed at the other women in the auditorium. It was like wandering in a carnival mirror maze coming again and again upon yourself. The same flowery face, the same chicken hands and jingling bracelets. One after another of the images of herself floated before her. She put out her hand, but it wasn't a mirror. It was another lady shaking her fingers and saying, We are waiting for Mr. Thurkel. Shh! Ah! Oh whispered everyone. The velvet curtains parted. Mr. Thurkel appeared fantastically serene, his Egyptian eyes upon everyone. But there was something, nevertheless, in his appearance which made one expect him to call high while fuzzy dogs jumped over his legs, through his hooped arms and over his back. Then, Dogs and all, he should dance with a dazzling piano keyboard smile off into the wings. Mrs. Bellows, with a secret part of her mind which she constantly had to grip tightly, expected to hear a cheap Chinese gong sound when Mr. Thurkel entered. His large, liquid, dark eyes were so improbable that one of the old ladies had facetiously claimed that she saw a mosquito cloud hovering over them, as they did around summer rain barrels. And Mrs. Bellows sometimes caught the scent of the theatrical mothball and the smell of calliope steam on his sharply pressed suit. But with the same savage rationalization that had greeted all other disappointments in her rickety life, she bit at the suspicion and whispered, This time it's real. 
This time it will work. Haven't we got a rocket? Mr. Thurkel bowed. He smiled a sudden comedy mask smile. The old ladies looked in at his epiglottis and sensed chaos there. Before he even began to speak, Mrs. Bellows saw him picking up each of his words, oiling it, making sure it ran smooth on its rails. Her heart squeezed in like a tiny fist, and she gritted her porcelain teeth. Friends, said Mr. Thurkel, and you could hear the frost snap in the hearts of the entire assemblage. No, said Mrs. Bellows ahead of time. She could hear the bad news rushing at her, and herself tied to the track while the immense black wheels threatened, and the whistle screamed, helpless. There will be a slight delay, said Mr. Thurkel. In the next instant, Mr. Thurkel might have cried, or been tempted to cry, ladies, be seated, in minstrel fashion, for the ladies had come up at him from their chairs, protesting and trembling. Not a very long delay, Mr. Thurkel put up his hands to pat the air, how long? Only a week. A week? Yes, you can stay here at the restorium for seven more days, can't you? A little delay won't matter, will it, in the end? You waited a lifetime. Only a few more days. At twenty dollars a day, thought Mrs. Bellows, coldly. What's the trouble? a woman cried. A legal difficulty, said Mr. Thurkel. We have a rocket, haven't we? Well, yes. But I've been here for a whole month waiting, said one lady. Delays, delays. That's right, said everyone. Ladies, ladies, murmured Mr. Thurkel, smiling serenely. We want to see the rocket. It was Mrs. Bellows forging ahead alone, brandishing her fist like a toy hammer. Mr. Thurkel looked into the old lady's eyes, a missionary among albino cannibals. Well, now, he said. Yes, now, cried Mrs. Bellows. I'm afraid, he began. So am I, she said. That's why we want to see the ship. No, no, now, Mrs., he snapped his fingers for her name. Bellows, she cried. She was a small container, but now all the seething pressures that had been built up over long years came steaming through the delicate vents of her body. Her cheeks became incandescent. With a wail that was like a melancholy factory whistle, Mrs. Bellows ran forward and hung to him, almost by her teeth, like a summer maddened spitz. She would not and never could let go, until he died, and the other women followed, jumping and yapping like a pound let loose on its trainer. The same one who had patted them, and to whom they had squirmed and whined joyfully an hour before, now milling about him, creasing his sleeves and frightening the Egyptian serenity from his gaze. This way, cried Mrs. Bellows, feeling like Madame Lafarge. Through the back, we've waited long enough to see the ship. Every day he's put us off. Every day we waited. Now let's see. No, no, ladies, cried Mr. Thurkel, leaping about. They burst through the back of the stage and out a door, like a flood, bearing the poor man with them into a shed, and then out, quite suddenly, into an abandoned gymnasium. There it is, said someone. The rocket. And then a silence fell that was terrible to entertain. There was the rocket. Mrs. Bellows looked at it, and her hands sagged away from Mr. Thurkel's collar. The rocket was something like a battered copper pot. There were a thousand bulges and rents and rusty pipes and dirty vents on and in it.
The pores were clouded over with dust, resembling the eyes of a blind hog. Everyone wailed a little sighing wail. Is that the rocket ship glory be to the highest? cried Mrs. Bellows appalled. Mr. Thurkel nodded and looked at his feet for which we paid out our one thousand dollars apiece and came all the way to Mars to get on board with you and go off to find him? asked Mrs. Bellows. Why, that isn't worth a sack of dried peas, said Mrs. Bellows. It's nothing but junk. Junk, whispered everyone getting hysterical. Don't let him get away. Mr. Turkle tried to break and run, but a thousand possum traps closed on him from every side. He withered. Everybody walked around in circles like blind mice. There was a confusion and a weeping that lasted for five minutes as they went over and touched the rocket, the dented kettle, the rusty container for God's children. Well, said Mrs. Bellows, she stepped up into the esky doorway of the rocket and faced everyone. It looks as if a terrible thing has been done to us, she said. I have not any money to go back home to Earth, and I've too much pride to go to the government and tell them a common man like this has fooled us out of our life savings. I don't know how you feel about it, all of you, but the reason all of us came is because I'm 85, and you are 89, and you are 78, and all of us are nudging on toward a hundred, and there is nothing on earth for us, and it does not appear there is anything on Mars either. We all expected not to breathe much more air or crochet many more doilies, or we'd never have come here. So what I have to propose is a simple thing, to take a chance. She reached out and touched the rusted hulk of the rocket. This is our rocket. We paid for our trip, and we are going to take our trip. Everyone rustled and stood on tiptoes and opened an astonished mouth. Mr. Thurkel began to cry. He did it quite easily and very effectively. We are going to get in the ship, said Mrs. Bellows, ignoring him, and we are going to take off to where we were going. Mr. Thurkel stopped crying long enough to say, but it was all a fake. I don't know anything about space. He is not out there anyway. I lied. I don't know where he is, and I could not find him if I wanted to. And you were fools to ever take my word on it. Yes, said Mrs. Bellows. We were fools. I'll go along on that. But you can't blame us, for we are old, and it was a lovely, good and fine idea, one of the loveliest ideas in the world. Oh, we did not really fool ourselves that we could get nearer to him physically. It was the gentle, mad dream of old people, the kind of thing you hold on to for a few minutes a day, even though you know it's not true. So... All of you who want to go, you follow me in the ship. But you can't go, said Mr. Thurkel. You haven't got a navigator, and that ship's a ruin. You, said Mrs. Bellows, will be the navigator. She stepped into the ship, and after a moment the other old ladies pressed forward. Mr. Thurkel when milling his arms frantically, was nevertheless pressed through the port. And in a minute, the door slammed shut. Mr. Thurkel was strapped into the navigator's seat 
with everyone talking at once and holding him down. The special helmets were issued to be fitted over every gray or white head to supply extra oxygen in case of a leakage in the ship's hull. And at long last, the hour had come, and Mrs. Bellows stood behind Mr. Thurkill and said, We're ready, sir. He said nothing. He pleaded with them silently, using his gray, dark, wet eyes. But Mrs. Bellows shook her head and pointed to the control. Take off, agreed Mr. Thurkill morosely and pulled a switch. Everybody fell. The rocket went up from the planet Mars in a great fiery glide with the noise of an entire kitchen thrown down an elevator shaft, with the sound of pots and pans, and kettles and fires bowling and stews bubbling, with the smell of burned incense and rubber and sulfur, with the color of yellow fire and a ribbon of red stretching below them, and all the old women singing and holding to each other, and Mrs. Bellows crawling upright in the sighing, straining, trembling ship. Head for space, Mr. Thurkel. It can't last, said Mr. Thurkel sadly. This ship can't last. It will... It did. The rocket exploded. Mrs. Bellows felt herself lifted and thrown about dizzily like a doll. She heard the great screamings and saw the flashes of bodies sailing by her in fragments of metal and powdery light. Help! Help! cried Mr. Thurkill far away on a small radio beam. The ship disintegrated into a million parts, and the old ladies, all one hundred of them, were flung straight on ahead with the same velocity as the ship. As for Mr. Thurkel, for some reason of trajectory, perhaps, he had been blown out the other side of the ship. Mrs. Bellows saw him falling separate and away from them, screaming, screaming. There goes Mr. Thurkel, thought Mrs. Bellows, and she knew where he was going. He was going to be burned and roasted, and broiled good, but very good. Mr. Thurkel was falling down into the sun. And here we are, thought Mrs. Bellows. Here we are, going on out and out and out. There was hardly a sense of motion at all, but she knew that she was traveling at 50,000 miles an hour and would continue to travel at that speed for an eternity until she saw the other women swinging all about her in their own trajectories. A few minutes of oxygen left to each of them in their helmets and each was looking up to where they were going. Of course, thought Mrs. Bellows, out into space, out and out, and the darkness like a great church, and the stars like candles. And in spite of everything, Mr. Thurkel, the rocket, and the dishonesty, we are going toward the Lord. And there, yes, there, as she fell on and on, coming toward her, she could almost discern the outline now. Coming toward her was his mighty golden hand, reaching down to hold her and comfort her like a frightened sparrow. I am Mrs. Amelia Bellows, she said quietly in her best company voice. I am from the planet Earth. The End Hall of Mirrors by Frederick Brown It is a tough decision to make whether to give up your life so you can live it over again. 
For an instant you think it is temporary blindness. The sudden dark that comes in the middle of a bright afternoon. It must be blindness, you think. Could the sun that was tanning you have gone out instantaneously, leaving you in utter blackness? Then the nerves of your body tell you that you are standing. Whereas only a second ago you were sitting comfortably, almost reclining, in a canvas chair, in the patio of a friend's house in Beverly Hills. Talking to Barbara, your fiancé, looking at Barbara, Barbara in a swimsuit, her skin golden tan in the brilliant sunshine. Beautiful. You wore swimming trunks. Now you do not feel them on you. The slight pressure of the elastic waistband is no longer there against your waist. You touch your hands to your hips. You are naked and standing. Whatever has happened to you is more than a change to sudden darkness or to sudden blindness. You raise your hands groppingly before you. They touch a plain smooth surface, a wall. You spread them apart and each hand reaches a corner. You pivot slowly. A second wall, then a third, then a door. You are in a closet about four feet square. Your hand finds the knob of the door. It turns and you push the door open. There is light now. The door has opened to a lighted room, a room that you have never seen before. It is not large, but it is pleasantly furnished, although the furniture is of a style that is strange to you. Modesty makes you open the door cautiously the rest of the way. But the room is empty of people. You step into the room, turning to look behind you into the closet which is now illuminated by light from the room. The closet is and is not a closet. It is the size and shape of one. But it contains nothing. Not a single hook, no rod for hanging clothes, no shelf. It is an empty, blank-walled, four-by-four-foot space. You close the door to it and stand looking around the room. It is about 12 by 16 feet. There is one door, but it is closed. There are no windows. Five pieces of furniture. Four of them you recognize, more or less. One looks like a very functional desk. One is obviously a chair, a comfortable-looking one. There is a table, although its top is on several levels instead of only one. Another is a bed or couch. Something shimmering is lying across it, and you walk over and pick the shimmering something up and examine it. It is a garment. You are naked, so you put it on. Slippers are part way under the bed or couch and you slide your feet into them. They fit. And they feel warm and comfortable, as nothing you have ever worn on your feet has felt, like lamb's wool, but softer. You are dressed now. You look at the door. The only door of the room except that of the closet, from which you entered it. You walk to the door, and before you try the knob, you see the small typewritten sign, pasted just above it, that reads, This door has a time lock set to open in one hour. For reasons you will soon understand, it is better that you do not leave this room before then. There is a letter for you on the desk. Please read it. It is not signed. You look at the desk and see that there is an envelope lying on it. You do not yet go to take that envelope from the desk and read the letter that must be in it. Why not? 
because you are frightened. You see other things about the room. The lighting has no source that you can discover. It comes from nowhere. It is not indirect lighting. The ceiling and the walls are not reflecting it at all. They did not have lighting like that back where you came from. What did you mean by back where we came from? You close your eyes. You tell yourself, I am Norman Hastings. I am an associate professor of mathematics at the University of Southern California. I'm 25 years old, and this is the year 1954. You open your eyes and look again. They did not use that style of furniture in Los Angeles or anywhere else that you know of in 1954. That thing over in the corner, you can't even guess what it is. So might your grandfather, at your age, have looked at the television set. You look down at yourself, at the shimmering garment that you found waiting for you. With thumb and forefinger, you feel its texture. It's like nothing you have ever touched before. I am Norman Hastings. This is 1954. Suddenly you must know, and at once, you go to the desk and pick up the envelope that lies upon it. Your name is typed on the outside. Norman Hastings. Your hands shake a little as you open it. Do you blame them? There are several pages, typewritten. Dear Norman, it starts. You turn quickly to the end and look for the signature. It is unsigned. You turn back and start reading. Do not be afraid. There is nothing to fear, but much to explain. Much that you must understand before the time lock opens the door. Much that you must accept and obey. You have already guessed that you are in the future, in what to you seems to be the future. The clothes and the room must have told you that. I planned it that way so the shock would not be too sudden, so you would realize it over the course of several minutes, rather than read it here, and quite probably disbelieve what you read. The closet from which you have just stepped is, as you have by now realized, a time machine. From it you stepped into the world of 2004. The date is April 7th, just 50 years from the time you last remember. You cannot return. I did this to you, and you may hate me for it. I don't know. That is up to you to decide, but it does not matter. What does matter, and not to you alone, is another decision which you must make. I'm incapable of making it. Who is writing this to you? I would rather not tell you just yet. By the time you have finished reading this, even though it's not signed, for I knew you would look first for a signature, I will not need to tell you who I am. You will know. I'm 75 years of age. I have, in this year 2004, been studying time for 30 of those years. I have completed the first time machine ever built, and thus far, its construction, even the fact that it has been constructed, is my own secret. You have just participated in the first major experiment. It will be your responsibility to decide whether there shall ever be any more experiments with it, whether it should be given to the world, or whether it should be destroyed and never used again. End of the first page. You look up for a moment, hesitating to turn the next page. Already you suspect what is coming. You turn the page. I constructed the first time machine a week ago. My calculations had told me that it would work, but not how it would work. I had expected it to send an object back in time. It works backwards in time only, not forward. Physically unchanged and intact. My first experiment showed me my error. 
I placed a cube of metal in the machine. It was a miniature of the one you just walked out of and set the machine to go backward ten years. I flicked the switch and opened the door, expecting to find the cube vanished. Instead, I found it had crumbled to powder. I put in another cube and sent it two years back. The second cube came back unchanged, except that it was newer, shinier. That gave me the answer. I had been expecting the cubes to go back in time, and they had done so, but not in the sense I had expected them to. Those metal cubes had been fabricated about three years previously. I had sent the first one back years before it had existed in its fabricated form. Ten years ago, it had been ore. The machine returned it to that state. Do you see how our previous theories of time travel have been wrong? We expected to be able to step into a time machine in, say, 2004, set it for 50 years back, and then step out in the year 1954. But it does not work that way. The machine does not move in time. Only whatever is within the machine is affected, and then just with relation to itself and not to the rest of the universe. I confirmed this with guinea pigs by sending one six weeks old five weeks back, and it came out a baby. I need not outline all my experiments here. You will find a record of them in the desk, and you can study it later. Do you understand now what has happened to you, Norman? You begin to understand, and you begin to sweat. The I who wrote that letter you are now reading is you, yourself, at the age of 75, in this year of 2004. You are that 75-year-old man with your body returned to what it had been 50 years ago with all the memories of 50 years of living wiped out. You invented the time machine, and before you used it on yourself, you made these arrangements to help you orient yourself. You wrote yourself the letter which you are now reading. But if those 50 years are to you gone, what all of your friends, those you loved, what of your parents? What of the girl you are going, were going, to marry? You read on. Yes, you will want to know what has happened. Mom died in 1963, dead in 1968. You married Barbara in 1956. I am sorry to tell you that she died only three years later, in a plane crash. You have one son. He's still living. His name is Walter. He is now 46 years old and is an accountant in Kansas City. Tears come into your eyes and for a moment you can no longer read. Barbara dead. Dead for 45 years. And only minutes ago in subjective time you were sitting next to her. Sitting in the bright sun in the Beverly Hills patio. You force yourself to read again. But back to the discovery. You begin to see some of its implications. You will need time to think to see all of them. It does not permit time travel, as we have thought of time travel. But it gives us immortality, of a sort. Immortality of the kind I have temporarily given us. Is it good? Is it worthwhile to lose the memory of 50 years of one's life in order to return one's body to relative youth? The only way I can find out is to try, as soon as I have finished writing this and made my other preparations. You will know the answer. But before you decide, remember that there is another problem, more important than the psychological one. I mean overpopulation. If our discovery is given to the world, if all who are old or dying can make themselves young again, 
the population will almost double every generation. Nor would the world, not even our own relatively enlightened country, be willing to accept compulsory birth control as a solution. Give this to the world as the world is today in 2004, and within a generation there will be famine, suffering, war, perhaps a complete collapse of civilization. Yes, we have reached other planets, but they are not suitable for colonizing. The stars may be our answer, but we are a long way from reaching them. When we do, someday, the billions of habitable planets that must be out there will be our answer, our living room. But until then, what is the answer? Destroy the machine? But think of the countless lives it can save, the suffering it can prevent. Think of what it would mean to a man dying of cancer. Think. Think. You finish the letter and put it down. You think of Barbara dead for 45 years, and of the fact that you were married to her for three years, and that those years are lost to you. Fifty years lost. You damn the old man of 75, whom you became, and who has done this to you, who has given you this decision to make. Bitterly, you know what the decision must be. You think that he knew, too, and realize that he could safely leave it in your hands. Damn him, he should have known. Too valuable to destroy, too dangerous to give. The other answer is painfully obvious. You must be custodian of this discovery and keep it secret until it is safe to give until mankind has expanded to the stars and has new worlds to populate, or until, even without that, he has reached a state of civilization, where he can avoid our population by rationing births to the number of accidental, or voluntary, deaths. If neither of those things had happened in another fifty years, and are they likely so soon, then you, at seventy-five, will be writing another letter like this one. You will be undergoing another experience similar to the one you are going through now, and making the same decision, of course. Why not? You'll be the same person again, time and again, to preserve the secret until man is ready for it. How often will you again sit at the desk like this one, thinking the thoughts you are thinking now, feeling the grief you now feel. There is a click at the door, and you know that the time lock has opened, that you are now free to leave this room, free to start a new life for yourself in place of the one you have already lived and lost. But you are in no hurry now to walk directly through that door. You sit there, staring straight ahead of you blindly, seeing in your mind's eye the vista of a set of facing mirrors, like those in an old-fashioned barber shop, reflecting the same thing over and over again, diminishing into far distance. The End <laughs>